All right. Uh, thank you for joining us today. This is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com, and that's uh, where you can go to vis visit and, and watch the interviews that we've been conducting, which have been um, for 2012 candidate interviews of independent and third-party candidates. I think it's really interesting to know more of our options, and, um, and uh, so we have... Uh, you know, we're more informed. Um, it's hard to make a decision if you don't know all the options that you have on, on something. And uh, and today we're interviewing um, uh, Andy Horning and in the um, s for the Senate. Uh, he's going to be on the ballots in Indiana this November 6, 2012. And um, and he's a libertarian. And uh, it's definitely a lot more interesting than a Republican or Democrat, I would say. And uh, this these are people that should be um, are available, you know, options that should be displayed on the news and the media, and, and they are starting to be more and more. Um, I do see a stat that you had on your website, Andy, about the 62% um, and the 82% and the 80%. Um, and so, yeah, Andy could make a lot of, you know, so how's Andy going to make changes? He can make a lot of changes by himself being a senator, but it will honestly help if he does have some support. And, and that's why this could also turn into a national campaign. And what we're suggesting is, um, you, you know, you, you make your best choice that you can with the, you, you know, information that you have. But uh, just imagine 50 plus um, candidates who are independent or third party um, being elected this year and how that would really uh, change things for for the better. It would uh, rock the votes. It would be a shot heard around the world. It, it definitely would put a um, some sands and pebbles into the gears of, uh, you know, the path that we have been going and towards a better one. It's like an emergency break um, in, in, in the Constitution. If we need to make a change, we have these uh, election cycles. And so, Andy, we usually ask um, to start off a little bit about you and uh, and what got you motivated uh, to you know get the um, what, what what you know you needed to do to get on the ballots in, in Indiana and and to run um, for office uh, as a senator in Indiana, Andy. And, and good good evening, sir. Thanks. Well, good evening to you too. And I guess the the answer is usually a little different from what you'd hear because I never wanted to be in politics. I I hate it maybe more than anybody I know. And it's kind of like, you know, if you find that you hate something bad enough, you'll try to find out where it lives, chase it down, and beat it with a stick. And that's more or less my approach to politics in so much as I, I really don't have any disrespect of a lot of the people who run for office. I've met an awful lot of really fine people in both Democrat and Republican parties. But our faith in politics has gone way out of control. And, you know, I work in the medical industry. I've, I've started in research. I did um, clinical work for many years, and I've been in the industry now for, oh, about 30 years. And um, I've only been fighting politics the whole time. Everything that politicians do in healthcare is stupid and counterproductive. And that's generally the way it works when you have, you know, a blunt tool like government, you know, or a toilet plunger something that, you know, you don't want to use it all the time, but you invoke it for everything. You would never imagine taking a toilet plunger and trying to educate your kids with it or care for your grandmother with it. But really, that's kind of how I see government. It is a blunt tool that you really should pull out only when somebody needs, you know, you need to flush some crud down something. You, you've got a bad guy that needs to be put away. You've got somebody who's committing fraud. You bring out this blunt, ugly, dirty tool and you use it, but you put it back again. And what we've done as a culture, unfortunately, is instead of looking at this as a, you know, maybe not even a necessary evil, but sort of an inevitable evil, instead of seeing it that way, we've made it into some kind of benevolent god. You know, we've, you know, we've made this great golden calf of government, and, and we feel we must make great sacrifices to it. And it's, it's embarrassing to watch from my perspective knowing, you know, what the free market could actually do and what it already has done for people's comfort, you know, the technology that, that it, we've seen in the last 150 years that have made our lives, you know, more comfortable and longer. So many cool things have happened from engineering and science and technology that have only been mucked up by politicians. And, you know, I feel it is more or less my mission to present a better way of living. Because, you know, what you were saying before about you know, the, where we are in politics and, and what this is really all about and, and who is really making the decisions, 
politics really only reflects who we are. We don't have anybody to blame for our choices. We've been choosing very badly. We've been, you know, molding ourselves into what we're told to do when it comes to a so-called two-party system that never existed either in law or practice. And, you know, the things that we're doing now in the voting booth are completely inexcusable. So really, it's come to the point where I don't have to explain to anybody why I'm offering an alternative on the ballot. The people who really have some explaining to do are those who would vote for the status quo now after so, you know, a hundred years of continuous broken promises and failures and increasingly dangerous, secretive, and hugely expensive government. Yeah, it's, I mean, and half the populace doesn't even usually vote um, so far. Maybe they will this year. And, and then the others that usually do vote, um, like you're saying, maybe they will um, eventually uh, pick um, the, 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 the option that doesn't zap them this time. I mean, maybe they'll, they'll learn. Um, but um, I, it, it's not like we're trying to zap them. I mean, it's just that, um, I mean, the Republicans, the Democrats, I mean, just that whole two-party apparatus, I mean, it, it's like a de-evolution after 20 years of picking, I'll just say 20 years of picking the lesser of two evils. Um, I mean, this is uh, w what you eventually get. I mean, you're stripped away of anything that's, um, y you know, 20 years of the lesser of two evils is like um, one election cycle of picking something that's really, really, like, super mm -hmm. evil, you know? Um, well, it's really been more than 20 years. I mean, when, it, when you really get down to it, voting has always been a problematic thing, and we, we've never had anything like a clean democratic process where there isn't cheating and name-calling and stupid things going on. It just, that could never happen. We're human beings, after all. The whole reason we have government is because we can't behave, and some of the people who, you know, behave the worst tend to go into government. So, you know, the process is always going to be a little bit ugly, but it's uglier than it has to be. And the real problem isn't even the voting process, because, you know, let's face it, this really has nothing to do with, with candidates. You know, the, the voting is really always about the voters. You know, election day is about those who are doing the electing. And we have what we've chosen. You know, we can't blame anybody else for anything in this democratic republic. Because, you know, not only do we have the choice to vote, you know, we don't have to pick up guns and, and make changes the way other people are doing, like with the Arab Spring and so on. I think we it just live. sounds too good to be true. I mean, that that's probably what it is. Oh. Like, we learned from our early age that things are too good to be true. They probably are. And, um, and, and you know what? It's, something is preventing people from... You, you know, easily, you know, changing this whole environment around, um, starting with, um, you, you know, we can go through the issues in a moment, but I mean, that, that's just a thought. Maybe it's, I, maybe that's off. That's just a brainstorm that I just, um, no, I don't even think that's it so much. You know, I don't think we want to admit that we've been choosing badly. You know, like if you, you, know, you hear this all the time where you'll hear people saying, oh, the public schools are terrible, except the one I send my little Billy to. You know, we don't want to, to you know, even admit the possibility that we're doing something wrong for our children. We don't want to admit that, you know, as we're sending our, you know, our son or daughter off to battle, that maybe that this doesn't have to be this way. You know, we just don't want to admit that. And so, you know, you think we've been doing this for so long, where we've been told that it's got to be Democrat, Republican, Republican, Democrat, that should the rules change all of a sudden, you know, this would be a major paradigm shift for most people. I don't think it's a matter of too good to be true. I think I it's just think a matter. So, we just don't want to. We just don't want to face the fact that we have been screwing up. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it, it very much is also a personal issue of who we s select and, and elect, and um, people that we can have confidence in, people who are going to adhere to their oath, and just the kind of character. I mean, especially nowadays, uh, character is something that. Um, will actually lead to the type of policies that are selected. But here's some of your issues here. Um, and, and we're looking on your issues page. Um, Supreme Court nomination, um, Social Security, uh, income tax. Um, and then you also have liberty, peace, law, um, security, prosperity. I, well, let's look at, um, let's first go to, um, real quick, um, 
uh, liberty and peace and law. I mean, can you kind of, you know, t talk about those three issues and then we'll go into some of the other ones as well. I mean, even well, though they might all relate, of course, but... Well, certainly they're all related. Yeah. You know, I, I, I guess, you know, if you're picking on just, you know, liberty, um, just as the first topic here, um, I don't know, you know, really why we ever thought that we had too much of it, that we have to sacrifice it, you know, in order to do something else. I, you know, I suppose we all have our vision of how life is supposed to work. But, you know, when Americans changed, I, you know, I suppose the greatest generation has to take some of the blame for the idea that, you know, fear-mongering should work on Americans. You know, the idea that, you know, we were so afraid that the Germans who had already, you know, attacked Russia in winter and were already in trouble and already could not have really mounted much of an attack on the United States by this time. We were, we were submitting ourselves to so much fear-mongering, and that has never stopped since that period, actually even before that. You know, I, I can't, you know, i got, got to look back and Well, I mean, we could go f way far back, yeah. I'm sure, but, I mean, that's an interesting, making decisions on fear. Um, I mean, here's an example of someone making a decision on fear. In 1992, or after the first the first Bush senior administration, uh, Dick Cheney said the reason why we didn't go into Iraq at that time, because this was after the 92 Iraq war, um, is because he knew that it would be like a civil war w without end and, and that, you know, it would be costly and we'd be policing Iraq and, and it just wouldn't be worth it. And then, but I guess, you, you know, when you're making a decision on fear, it, it's uh, and, and possibly for oil companies, um, as Paul O'Neill, the Treasury Secretary, um, alluded to, um, who was also in the Bush administration, saying they were divvying it up even before 9/11, um, uh, and that's on um, uh, 60 Minutes. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's uh, and it was also in a book. Uh, he, it, it's, it's it's so he, he changed his position, one of a decision made on confidence, and then a second one made on fear. And then there's lots of other examples as well. Well, but then he also looked, you know, and in some of those decisions, you know, you can follow the money and see when you know the. Um, you know, Arabs decided to, you know, stop taking dollars and trade, and they switched to euros as the trade unit for, for oil. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, that's that a good a point. Deal. A lot of people don't know, and isn't that what Libya was going to do? Yep, yep, yep. So, you know, when you, the fragility of our dollar is a big issue there. But, I mean, getting back to liberty, you know, we really haven't had, you and I are not old enough to remember what life was like you know, before we had the Federal Reserve System and income tax and all the things that we now call federal programs. We don't, nobody alive today, in fact, has a memory of how roads were built before road programs or how schools were built before we had a Department of Education. Well, I mean, I suppose the, the Federal Department of Education isn't that old, but at the state level, it's been some time since, you know, the local units had real local schools, you know, before they became government schools. So everybody today is raised in a government school. We drive on government roads, and it's not really without any basis that that Obama did make that ridiculous claim of his, you know, you didn't build that, because to a very large degree, all of us have been coddled and pre-programmed and trained and put into a false dependency situation with government. And we don't have any memory of how life worked when, you know, churches and fraternal organizations and your neighborhood association were the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. They were the insurance policy. You know, they were how society worked before government came in and took over all that stuff. Now, that's another good point. I mean, it's as far as about... Um you know our perspectives what we're kind of trained uh what what we've grown up in like we can't even imagine certain other situations and uh and that, that's so true i mean sometimes i just try to you, you know as an exercise try to catch myself in, in different things um i mean whether it has to do with government or just even in our own daily lives you know um and, sure. well, uh, some of it's just the dirt simple stuff we would many of us would rather give up you know 60 percent of our of everything we have just so that we don't have to make the decisions you know, necessary to give all that money back to us and make us pay for somebody to fix the road in front of us. You know, in other words, if it only cost us, you know, 5% of what we do to maintain life as it is today, 
um, but we'd have to make individual decisions on, do I, am I going to fix the road in front of my house? Am I going to pay somebody to do it? Am I going to send my kid to a school down the street, or am I going to do it myself? You know, all of those decisions that are taken away, and sort of like the convenience payments you get, you know, from the gas company or something, you pay extra for that. And in the case of government, you pay hugely extra for that. And so if you ask most people, you know, uh, since they have no memory of what freedom would really look like or how, you know, how life could be sweet indeed with the technology of today and the freedom of yesterday, you know, if, if we could um, explain to most people how it would work, most people without any knowledge of that would probably still say, well, you know what, I think I would rather pay more for government to do this than for me to have to make the decision myself. Well, it, 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 you know, here's, um, I mean, uh, uh, thoughts for people out there. Now, we're getting really into the heart of the matter, I think, um, and I'm sure that, you know, if there's progressives listening in here, they're probably, uh, you, you know, thinking of things um, to argue back. But um, now, uh, and what we're, in the long run, in the long run, I mean, where our eventually the end game, the, the goal of our society is to be free. I mean, that actually isn't going in the past. It's actually going in the future um, because the past is, um, well, actually, if you go really, really far back, maybe it was really free, but then once we build up civilizations, it got to be, um, you know, you know uh, like law and order. And then, and then after that, so we might return, you know, back to the future, whatever. But um, it, it's, but, you know, improved, of course, but really a civilized society, I, I mean, uh, the, you know, the ultimate rule would eventually be once we're all mature enough, um, uh, you know, basically like the golden rule, uh, I mean, and, and, and things like that. But um, now we know that's not going to happen tomorrow. Well, you never know. I don't know that. But but there are things that can catapult and, and, and get us, you know, big hop skips uh, exponentially get us um, in, in progress to where we are now. Um, and um, I mean, right now, I mean, we, we have like, you know, and I'm sure a lot of people, you, you know, d d don't quite have the concept of, you know, private roads um, and, and stuff like that. Um, but it, 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 but people shouldn't like listen to that and feel like, you know, oh, I can't even listen to that. I mean, people should really think about what um, is being said. And, well, and, and and why and and also um, I I mean now it's it, there is um, you, you know a lot of actually um, cr you know kind of a cross audience I think between especially nowadays in 2012 between like libertarians progressives green parties libertarians uh, even conservatives Democrats um, independents I mean people are so fed up like like you said at, at the beginning where I mean I think um, anyone no matter what their spectrum could possibly see you as the uh, alternate choice uh, this year and and um, see, see it as a benefit. I mean, what do you say to those people that are, um, well, like, and, and, and so you might need to reach out to conservatives, but what about people that, that do like the public roads and stuff like that? What would you say to um, people like that specifically? Well, but, uh, we have two problems, right? One problem is people don't imagine uh, what we don't have anymore. You know, we what, what is gone is gone, not just historically speaking, but from our heads. But the second problem is that we're too comfortable with what we do have. You know, the, you know, the massive injustice around us, you know, the violence, you know, the continuous warfare and all of that, most of us don't see that as a problem. And in fact, you know, if you ask the average Republican, you know, he's, he's, a lot of them are still pitching for a fight with somebody else. As we're still waging battles all over the world, we've got our armies and, you know, well over half the nations of the world with guns pointed at the other half. We're still looking for enemies. And, you know, when, when you're faced with this kind of absurd situation where we're so massively in debt, you know, our... Our financial picture, globally speaking, with you know sort of the global fiat um, banking system, the money changers running the, the world, that's so absurd and out of control and unsustainable that you would think people would be looking more desperately for options. But I think the biggest problem is not really just that we can't picture what we had in the past, it's we can't picture what we have right now. We're not seeing clearly, you know, what we have become, you know, who we have become and what we're doing on, you know, the global level. We yeah. just don't see it. A lot of things are taken for granted. Let me ask you this. What, what would be, like, if you had, if you could 
like with a magic wand or with like a coalition in Congress, um, get the foreign policy that, that you exactly want. I mean, um, or let's say 99.99% of it. Um, I, how, what, what would be like one, of course we can't predict a future completely, but what do you think would be your forecast would be the, the, the vision of America and the vision of the world if we implemented whatever your vision of a foreign policy and our military um, policy would be? Well, you know, fortunately, it's, it's all written down and has been for quite a long time. If you look at my website at HorningForSenate.com, you know, I think that probably, you know, I've got some small digestible bits, you know, under the headings that you were mentioning um, and a bunch of others. But if you look at the annotated constitutions I have there, I have a U.S. Constitution and, importantly, the Indiana Constitution for my state because, you know, the, the original role of a senator was to defend his state against the encroachment of the federal government. And then there were some other you know, issues related to, you know, how war and, you know, appointments and things like that were to be conducted. And uh, it's all written down in the Constitution. And my annotations in those constitutions, I think, lay out pretty clearly where we've just gone completely off the rails. So if you read those, um, you really shouldn't have a whole lot of question about, you know, what my uh, action plan would be in the Senate. It's, it's pretty well laid out. Uh, we do not have constitutional rule of law in this country. Anybody who's read the constitutions knows that we're, you know, just way off the rails. But, you know, the, the fact that there is also in the Constitution a method of getting back to it, you know, should we screw up, you know, there's nullification, and even in, like in the citizen jury level, you know, there's so many ways where we can, you know, put things right again, that that would be my job. My job would be to put things right, get rid of what's unconstitutional. If we have to amend the Constitution, we can amend the Constitution. But for goodness sakes, we've got to go legit. And in that process of going legit, you know, wiping out the things that are just clearly lawless and out of control and corrupt, um, we would have discussions about, you know, do we really want to amend the Constitution? Do we want to make, you know, one of the functions of government be to, you know, build roads for everybody? Because that's, we never amended the Constitutions to allow that. Okay, so, I, yeah, they're the ones who are actually, like the Republicans and the Democrats, they're the ones who are really the anarchists because they're the ones who got rid of the rule of law. When you pass a law like the NDAA, absolutely. when people can just snatch you up without, um, like, like um, you, you know, you just like like an alien abduction you never heard from again, um, it, it's... It, I mean, that's really getting rid of the rule of law. That's saying might makes right. Um, I'm the boss, and, and there's no more. I'm above the law, and that really gets rid of the law. So they're the real anarchists. They, well, they're the only, the anarchists. Yeah, the, the, the only difference between a gang and a mob and government is scale. You know, if, if a gang gets big enough and powerful enough, they get well-armed enough that they can take over the government, they're government. And it, that doesn't make it legitimate. The only thing that, you know, really legitimizes our government is the rule of law and whatever is unauthorized is not governed it's ungoverned politics and what we have right now is as you say a lawless gang of lawbreakers yeah i mean there's there's i mean there, there's a charade that there, actually, there are people like good people there that that there are right to and, and try to speak out and that's how we well we also know just because what we can see right in front of us but um I, what I was trying to say about the war thing is, I mean, if that was the only thing like a coalition could accomplish, which I'm not saying it is, I mean, there's so many issues on the table, but just if that was the only thing that we could get under control, I mean, that would be the start of a political revolution right there. I, I mean, just getting the military industrial complex under control, getting, I mean, our issues of war and peace under control, and that affects a huge part of the budget. It also affects you know our psyche as well I, I would argue and and then it affects uh, corporate welfare it affects um sure, people's sure. attitude about like what they can get away with and um and uh and things like that so i mean if that was the only thing that you could accomplish um uh and, and you did accomplish it um i mean that would you, you know w wouldn't be the end goal but i mean that would be somewhat of a big oh, success that's pretty, that would, would be a pretty huge, good one it would be a huge I mean, game changer, right? The there. two, the two biggest game changers, seriously, are two things that actually even Ron Paul was making his, his big campaign for the last thirty years. Well, actually, since 1971, you know, was when um, 
you know, he's talking about both the money changers and the standing army, the same things that, you know, our founders warned us against, the same thing that Eisenhower was talking about with his military industrial speech. You know, you, you think about how many presidents warned us about this, how many, you know, wise people. You know, I, I suppose that the founders, you kind of expect that. But when presidents, people who had the keys to the White House, are warning us about the powers that were over their head, you know, that you guys really ought to be worried about the people that I worry about, we should have heeded that. And that's exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about the military-industrial complex and, you know, the money changers, you know, these people that have more, not, not only do they have all the money they could possibly want, they decide what money is. And that kind of power was supposed to be denied anybody in this country. That's why it's written into both state and federal constitutions. And I've read several state constitutions, not all of them are the same, but at least Indiana's constitution and the federal constitution both have specific mandates for specie payment. And in fact, in Indiana constitution, it says that shall never be suspended. And, in, and what that means is we should always have some kind of hard backing, some kind of sound money, as opposed to the fiat currency, you know, the the negotiated IOU slips that are run by the global the, the, the banking network now. Of wealth. I mean, they should be called TOWs, transfer of wealth bills. Um, now, Ron Paul actually offered, um, like you mentioned, Ron Paul, uh, competing currencies. I mean, I think that sure. is actually very a smart idea. Um, we already have that anyways. Like, if you think about, you, you know, the, the Forex exchange and all that, so I'm sure it could be done, especially nowadays um and that way uh, not all our eggs are in one basket per se and 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 actually everything does have a value anyways compared to different commodities well, like there's always been alternative currencies and and the, yeah. the constitutions you know all you know none of them ever gave government the monopoly power that it's taken and and so we used to have state coins we used to have you know individual businesses and individual banks would offer their own forms of currency there's all kinds of barter coupons and trades and electronic certificates you can pass back and forth there's in the, what we should be looking at is that the constitution was so far ahead of what we're doing right now you know, we've gone backwards. We've gone back thousands of years in our form of government. We think that any of this is new. It's not. It's ancient. We've been warned about this over and over and over again for thousands of years. And if you look to see what, you know, the, the rewriting of the Indiana Constitution was significant and that it was because the state went broke over investing in public transportation, you know, the, the canal building boom of its day, that it had, it felt it had to rewrite the Constitution that it previously violated, of course, but they rewrote it because, you know, the, the fact of the matter was, you know, we had abused, you know, this whole idea of money and government investment and, you know, the idea that government is a friend as opposed to a, a dangerous, dangerous enemy. Yeah, and we say the government, like, as this, if, 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 well, it does act like it's not in our interest and it's not a part of us, we the people, but um, we really should reclaim the uh, term that um, it, it's, it's us, it's us. It and, is us. And that's like what you're saying, re yep. responsibility. Um, and and what about, about um, uh, some topics that I think are going to be growing in the coming years? Um, here's three topics. Like, well, I, I think I pretty much think no. I mean, you 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 want a free internet, right? Of course. I mean, I would assume so. If if you're you know libertarian, is that? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I want free everything, but you know, the, it's not like. But you know, one of the things that the people make mistakes about though and I, I should clear that up is that you know a lot of people think that means no regulation and that's absolutely false because one of the you well, know, the internet has the best regulation with like amazon.com ebay i mean all those reviews well and stuff. what i mean what i mean is that one of government's valid roles is to prevent you know is to at least oppose fraud and um and stealing you know so however you want to call stealing and, and defrauding people out of things a valid role of government is to put a you know some kind of leash on that now of course we have to have a leash on government for that to work um, and that's what the constitutions are for but you know I happen to believe there is a valid role for government and even you know in, in environmental affairs there are things that can't be owned like air and water that um, you know inherently are prone to abuse and, and hoarding and you know people can dam up a creek and make somebody else's property go dry and you got to have somebody um, that's got the authority to you know march in and say you can't do that so government does have a role 
in certain in certain cases. But like I already said, it's a very crude tool. It's something you don't want to invoke all the time. It's only you only bring out government when somebody's really doing something rotten and it's defrauding, it's stealing, it's harming somebody. If it's not harming you. You're a rule of law guy. I mean, it's actually a, it's like they call libertarian. Some people say libertarians anarchism. I mean, they're the ones who are the anarchists. They're the yep. ones who are yep. um, uh, without the rule of law. It, it's They've turned it, or, you, you know, they shouldn't even be able to make that argument um, like like forcefully at all um, now what about um, the, the drug war and, 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 and like you know the pro you know pro-life pro-choice uh, d- debate how, how where, where do you come down on, on those two things sir well I, it's going to be different from some people you know and, and I'm not you know I'm not one of, I've worked in the medical industry my whole life I'm not one of those people who's going to say that pot is harmless and and um, you know that it can't hurt you only yeah it, it can hurt you but you know, I see what we have done in the war on drugs in terms of the, you know, abuse of power, um, the defocusing of our police forces, you know, the loss of rights. It's crazy, just crazy. And when I was talking about, you know, when do you bring in this monster we call government, you know, this toilet plunger, this ogre, you know, when, when do you really want to bring out this attack dog? Well, you don't want to do it when somebody's just hurting themselves and nobody else. Or even if somebody is just kind of, you know, smoking pot in their own house, it's just not worth invoking this monster about. We should never have started this. And in fact, you know, the, the point of the matter is it's all unconstitutional, and obviously so. You know, when we passed the 18th Amendment to, you know, make it illegal to sell liquor, and then we passed the 21st Amendment to make it legal again, there wasn't any other law that interposed it. They understood they had to amend the Constitution to prohibit the sale and use of anything. So they did it properly. They realized it was stupid, and they undid it. But no law since then has given the government the power that they had between the 18th and 21st Amendments. Isn't that the so, last amendment? That, or were, had there been, are, are there more than 21 amendments? Or, I'm sorry, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. 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 Yeah. But, you know, the... the you know, in fact, I guess I have to say that as we got more and more amendments, they got stupider and stupider. So I'm not, you know, I don't, I'm not a fan of the Constitution, but it still is the best thing that we've ever come up with. So, you know, in so much as we have um, these documents that have been amended many times, they can be amended many times more, we should stick to what we've got, and if we need to change something, we can change something. So, you know, I, for goodness sakes, we've had um, uh, even you know, our, our last amendment, you know, the 27th Amendment, you know, congressional pay. My gosh, we've had amendments for all kinds of stuff. If we needed to make an amendment for, um, you know, for the war on drugs, we could do that. But, but short of that, it's not legitimate, and it's foolish anyway. And, you know, to get to your other questions about, you know, I'm, I'm pro-life. I'm very pro-life. And, and I guess I'm one of those libertarians that... Um, actually find it kind of problematic to think that, you know, that libertarians should be, you know, so glib about saying that, you know, only women have reproductive rights and that, you know, a man has to pay, you know, child support for 21 years if the baby lives, but he has no right to say whether it's going to live or die otherwise. And, you know, when you look to see how unjust the situation is, and do you really want politicians to be able to say who's human and who's not? Yeah, I'm pro-life, but what does that mean and what happens at the federal level? I'm pretty much along the line of Ron Paul on this, too, where, you know, yes, Roe v. Wade was obviously unconstitutional, totally unconstitutional. The, the Supreme Court can't pass laws anyway. So, you know, the, the idea that there's, um, you know, something I would do related to abortion, at least with Roe v. Wade, if I could, doesn't get around the fact that most issues are not federal issues. And even murder, if you wanted to call it that, is not a federal issue. That's a state-level issue unless you know, there are things that go across state lines. And where there are problems across state lines, that's generally a judicial issue. So you know, when it comes to um, this pro-life or pro-choice issue, I'm, I'm pretty unabashedly pro-life. But constitutionally, I wouldn't have very much authority to do very much about it it's still going to be up to other authorities. Yeah, I mean, there, there are, you know, like, situations like rape and incest and stuff like that, which, which like, makes it a sticky situation, and that's why Ron Paul, I think, you know, says the state level is the best way to deal with that, and, um, 
and and I don't know if we have all the answers yet. I mean, it's 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 a really tough issue. I can understand not wanting our tax dollars to go to that for sure. Um, like for some people, and 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 I can you know if someone, it, I guess it really depends. People have a different opinion on when life begins, but. Um, or what life is, yeah, sure. People and some have all people could have, you know, as an opposition of their tax dollars going to wars um, that they don't believe in either. Um, but let's let's be clear on the history of this. When we have given, you know, politicians the power to decide who's human and who's not, who gets right and who doesn't, it's turned out pretty badly. You know, the, the, you're talking about like the Nazis or the Russians and, you know, who's really taken that power to the limit. It's not good. It's bad history, and we want to tread very lightly on that. It's not something you want to just flippantly say, "I'm pro-choice," and you know, yeah. and then think you're done with it. Because it's not. You're not done with it. And no, once we you give, be very thoughtful, especially about these life and death situations. And I'm, I'm glad that you are. I, I'm just saying. I think the debate's still open, um, and uh, and we we shouldn't flippantly like you know just say you know it's definitely not a living being or, or anything like that. Um, Either, I, I, um, but um, it, it's 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 hard, it's hard to say. I, I I don't know exactly when it begins, but I, I think hopefully more and more in the future it just won't even have to be um, you know something that that comes up anyways. There could be preventative measures and, and other things through education and stuff. And um, yeah, no, and I think anybody would agree that we should be having fewer abortions. You know, we should be looking for ways to you know reduce unwanted pregnancies and you know find better ways of adopting and you know, make it easier. And I mean, there are all kinds of things we should be doing. But it could definitely but be most a slippery slope for sure. I mean, you could imagine in the future, um, you, you know, like uh, which half of our sci-fi movies are some kind of you, you know like a totalitarian states. Um, and uh, you know where people could be genetically modified and born just uh, and they're owned by a corporation. So how would someone yeah. like to be born into that world? Um, and uh, so, so it's I don't know if it's it, you know. And then they would argue, oh, we well we created them without a brain, so they won't feel anything. It's kind of like you know, Planet <laughs> of the Apes or Gattaca yeah. or stuff like that. Um, well, yeah. here, how we usually close off here is like asking you if there's um, any um, and and I'll ask you also if there's anything I forgot but is there any um, you know people historical people people living nowadays modern people that uh, have influenced you um, positively negatively that you would like to share that that you know might be insightful to us and and, and, and your reasons why and so who's someone that you might have been thinking about lately or or, or something like that well you know I, I guess it, 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 a lot of people make up stuff when they get asked this question, and I hesitate to answer it because it it changes by your mood, and you know you don't really know how much and people influence kind of come like and go. Lately, you know, yeah. of course it can. I mean, change. obviously, you know, somebody who's who's influenced anybody who would find me interesting is Ron Paul. Um, you know, he's he's really made it. While a lot of us have been doing what Ron Paul has been doing, you know, speaking about rule of law and constitutional liberty and justice. I've been doing this for, you know, decades, but, you know, since 19, well, really since 2008, I guess we have to say Ron Paul was fighting pretty much in the trenches like the rest of us until 2008, and he suddenly, it became cool to be libertarian, and I've got to give the credit you know, where it's due, it, it, it's not even really just Ron Paul. The, the movement of Ron Paul had almost nothing to do with his campaign. And, uh, you know, young people have really awakened to that message. And I'm certainly grateful to Ron Paul for being just, you know, such an excellent ambassador for, you know, what we have been trying to fight for for a very long time. So I, I guess I would have to say he's, you know, among living politicians anyway. He's certainly, you know, the the uh, cake um, when it comes to guys who stand on principle. Well, he's been the vessel, vessel for truth. I mean, truth has found its easiest um, path of least resistance through Ron Paul in, in these yeah. last, um, y y you know, basically since, uh, well, for a while, like you said, but I, I mean, especially, I mean, I think there's a new attitude after like things like the Patriot Act started passing and we went to war in Iraq and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people really started to say like you know we got to you know turn this ship around i mean it, it was bad before but now it's going into hyper but you know when we had nuclear missiles pointed at us you know right across you know in, in cuba and you know the russians were 
pretty serious threat. We did not give up liberties the way we do now. You know, we weren't getting groped in airports. And, and so, you know, the, it, it should be that people are looking, you know, guys with exploding underpants have us this scared. Now, really? there's a brief thing of McCarthyism, you know, but that was defeated. And, and it's not like, you know, these terrorists are a bigger threat than the Soviet Union. I mean, it's not like the Soviet Union didn't use terrorism tactics. Um, it's not like they didn't have any spies and espionage and... and, and well, it's not like McCarthy was even wrong. I mean, a lot of what he said really was correct. But, you know, you, you, can, you can say that all you want about the messenger of that, and then he was, you know, there are lots of problems with McCarthyism. But, you know, the fact is, we've been fighting, you know, our government uh, for, you know, since the ink was wet on the Constitution. And when, you know, the Alien and Sedition Acts were passed... Um, Jefferson and Madison themselves both drafted the you know, Kentucky and Virginia resolutions to affirm the notion that these things should be considered null and void and the states should oppose any unconstitutional federal action. So right, right from the very beginning, you know, we've been fighting our own government. Right, right. And yeah, Woodrow Wilson did some similar things in World War One. I. I mean, John Adams is one of my favorite presidents, but except for that, Alien and Sedition Act, and, and he was the one who, like, was all principled because he defended, you know, that British um, uh, soldier, um, even though yeah, yeah. those people were saying that they he didn't deserve a trial. Um, and uh, so it's, it's a lot, lot of hypocritical things. Of course, Thomas Jefferson had slaves, also bought the Louisiana Purchase. And, um, but, I mean, I would have to argue that the Louisiana Purchase probably was a good decision. Um, and uh, so it's, you, you know, I guess that's life. But uh, anything I forgot to mention, uh, Andy, that you'd like to bring up uh, in this well, interview as well? Yeah, yeah anybody can ask me questions. And, yeah. yeah, I encourage uh, anybody to ask me questions. You know, I reply to stuff if people ask me. And I, if you look at my website at horningforsenate.com, and, uh, you know, if, <laughs> of course, if you read all this stuff there and still have any questions, my gosh, you must, you must really want a lot of information. But... Um, Sure, it's all there, yeah, and I'm color? available. I'm just kidding. It's, it's, but it's H-O-R-N-I-N-G-F-O-R, senates.com. Uh, Correct. Horning and in fact, if, if you just Google Andy Horning, I, I'm usually the first thing that comes up, so you'll find you'll find it. Even if you're not in Indiana, I mean, like, not every state is having a senatorial um, uh, a race this year, and um, so maybe you might want to um, have someone that, you know, since Ron Paul is not going to be there next year, I think it's time for us to have this 50-plus independents and third-party people sent um, because, I mean, who's going to speak up against, well, you know, who's going to speak for us, we the people, and um, and so, I, you know, even if you're in Hawaii, let's say, you might want to support Horning for Senate or, or well, Hawaii's having a senatorial one, but, you know, you could be in Alaska or wherever. Yeah. Well, I mean, you could just, uh, let me just do one last thing, if, if anything else is, you know, if, if our concern is that we think our politicians have been bought up, you can look up my campaign fund and see that I'm certainly not bought off. And, and, and actually, we, we can make the money a little less irrelevant. Now, now we should be donating sure. because that will definitely help your campaign. But um, can, the people can contribute in a lot of different ways. I mean, time equals money, so people can, you know, think about, like, maybe, um, you, you know, check their schedule and see what they can do. And, and, and you know, town halls, the debates. Oh, we look forward to seeing in the debates. I'm sure that will be exciting, right? Yes, I will be in two televised debates. And, you, and you're right. The only thing money does even with the other guys, is, is by a message you know, that you're spreading around a little bit. And if we can do that without money, that would be a so much smarter way to, to run a campaign. Yeah, let them waste their money, you know, and, and lose. Well, but, you know, if, if we would actually do our homework as voters, all of that money would just dry up. You would no longer be effective. There'd be no reason for it because if we if we can see right, right. you know what exactly. these guys are all about, and if we did our homework properly, if we followed the money and found out that you know that the Democrats and Republicans they're not two different parties. You know we know that the guys in charge are not the guys on the ballot, and so you know if if you look and you know you see who's really running the country now, and you do just a little bit of homework, 
then we can make all of these campaign funding questions irrelevant. Yeah, I know. Watch the debates. I mean, just, I mean, type into, uh, you, you know, I mean, I, I, I get all my information pretty much off the Internet nowadays, and, and hopefully that's what people are just going to do. They're just going to Google it and find out who's running it and then pick the best person. But I think, I guess, if you're younger and stuff, I mean, and if you have some relatives who are not, I think a very good thing to do is maybe download a couple of uh, horning videos, download the debates, bring them to your grandparents' house or your aunts or uncles or whoever and, and on the on your laptop or whatever, burn it to a disc and play it for them and, and let them get have a real opportunity, you know. Reach out great like Great idea. That. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, um, it was great uh, interview here, great talking with you. And um, so now people do have, a, a, you know, a, a, an actual... Well, another interview, uh, hopefully many more for you um, that they can help in their decision-making process. I think, um, you know, this, this year it's, it's, it's definitely clear, I, I, you know, it's, it's a vote for us or it's a vote for the special interests and um, that uh, have been in power for, uh, you know, way too long. And, um, Andy, I'll say goodbye to you right after this interview ends. Um, and so thank you again for your time, sir. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.